I, I first ran into Mike. He was an undergraduate engineering student, and he took my applied ecology course and got the top mark and impressed me. And then he, he decided he, he'd go into ecology, and so he took some qualifying courses and then did a, a field master study with me on uh, cyclic recruitment variation in pike minnow populations up in the interior, really nasty field study. And then he started to do his PhD on that same problem. And my insert uh, funding got cut off. And he luckily for all of us I had to change projects. So he did a, an incredible PhD uh, project on Skeena River salmon management, optimization of in season and multi year, uh, multi stock harvesting on the Skeena. Uh, while having to go to work for DFO in his current position partway through when I ran out of other money. So I thought Mike could be talking about his doctoral work or his Fraser River Heart Management Strategy Evaluation, but this is an interesting topic. Take it away, Mike. Uh, thanks, Carl. And yeah, I mean, I, I might not be quite quantitative enough for the quantitative seminar, but uh, this is <clears throat> a big bar landslide has been kind of what I've done since July of 2019. It's been uh, really interesting and, and really all encompassing for me. I've spent a, a lot more time than I would have expected in uh, Lillooet and Clinton and, uh, and other uh, kind of pretty darn remote field sites um, for a sockeye analytical biologist. Uh, it's been real rewarding. Uh, and, and I think just given how, at least in the, uh, in the BC news it is, I, I thought folks might be more interested in hearing about that than about my, uh, my thesis work. And if I'm wrong, well, I'm sorry I've wasted your time. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, yeah, I, I guess I should just probably uh, jump right into it um, and uh, see where we are. I guess the first thing I, I did want to say is, um, you know, this isn't the work that Mike's doing all by himself. Uh, it, it's a massive uh, field project. It's, there was a, a high number of First Nations participants, uh, uh, both local to the landslide area as well as in the Upper Fraser and uh, in the Lillooet area. Uh, lots of folks from all over Fisheries and Oceans Canada came to help out both with the initial emergency response as well as with the, the monitoring that we've been doing since. Uh, particularly, I want to mention uh, Ben Sutherland at the Molecular Genetics Lab in Nanaimo, who's been really helpful um, making sure we're able to uh, assign the different fish we catch to stocks. And then um, a lot of different folks from uh, the Salmon Enhancement Program and Stock Assessment, as well as David Patterson and Kendra Robinson uh, from the Freshwaters Group. They're currently uh, out at SFU. Uh, they provided a lot of uh, you know, hands-on experience with the radio telemetry part in particular and, and, uh, and are pretty key in analyzing the data. Um, there's a bunch of consultants who helped out as well, uh, in stream, cold stream, and ecofish. And this whole thing uh, kind of unfolded on, um, on the, the ranch of a, a local landowner, Danny Phillips, who's uh, been through a lot uh, with people tromping all over his place, leaving his cattle uh, gates open and so forth. So I uh, just want to mention him as well. Um, talk outline. Uh, I'm just going to uh, give a, a bit of background on the Big Bar landslide and study area. I wasn't 100% sure who all would be attending this seminar. Uh, I know some people are intimately familiar with the area and the species, and this might be a little repetitive for them, but um, I'm trying to give enough context that uh, folks who are new to it can understand why, why we care uh, about a landslide a third of the way up the Fraser River. Um, then I'll introduce, um, you know, my monitoring programs, objectives, and, and our observations. Um, you know, we're right in the middle of preparing for a 2021 season. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about our plans for that as well. I've got uh, uh, some time for questions at the end, and I have a couple of supplemental slides if, um, if the questions go that way. 
So uh, I guess the, the big thing is, uh, again, um, I'm not sure how familiar different folks are with it, but the Fraser River is the, uh, the largest river in British Columbia. Uh, it, it supports uh, five species of Pacific salmon, as well as a, a steelhead. I think Rob Bison gave us talk about uh, the interior Fraser steelhead a couple of seminars ago. Um, it's a it's a huge water body. Um, you know, it's it's months of migration for salmon from the river mouth all the way to their spawning areas in the uh, upper watershed. It's also a, a very remote workplace uh, where we are. There's um, I, I got a couple of red stars on there. One's kind of representing the Kamloops office. One's representing the uh, the, the DFO office in Vancouver that I work out of. And the black star there kind of indicates where the waterfall is. Um, it's, it's logging roads to get there. They're not great roads uh, and they come apart pretty bad when it rains or snows. Um, it's about, you know, four to six hours of driving to the trailhead uh, and then another hour or two and you have to take a reaction ferry across the river to access the site. So it's, it's pretty far out there. There's no power or cell service on site. Um, it's also a really cool part of the province. It's um, it's what's called the hot, dry ponderosa pine biogeoclimatic ecosystem, but it's it's a really interesting area. Um, about 40 degrees down by the river in the summer um, in, in the canyon, the heat coming off the walls. It's a pretty fun place to be wandering around in, in waders trying to catch fish. Um, there's also some pretty interesting geology uh, throughout the whole phrase, but in that area in particular, it's a bedrock canyon. Um, and, uh, and what that means is because the canyon rock walls are rock, there's a, a pretty interesting flow and erosion mechanisms at work there. Um, unlike other areas where maybe one side or both sides of the river are, are, are sand or loose material and the river can spread out, it's very constrained through through the area where the water slide is, which means that um, at most flow levels, the, the water is moving through there at a pretty good clip and, and is, a, is a challenge for migration. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Vendetti at um, SFU published a really nice review of bedrock canyons in the Fraser watershed in uh, 2014 in Nature, if you're interested in rocks uh, the way I am. I recommend checking it out. Um, a couple of photos next, just to kind of show the, the magnitude of the slide. Uh, this is a, a photo uh, from before the slide when uh, someone was taking a rafting trip through there. It used to be an area of rock uh, rapids. Um, and the red line kind of indicates where material is going to fall off. Um, just and then this is a, a similar photo, a slightly different perspective, but uh, the red line kind of indicates the area where, where a whole pile of rock just sheared off. Um, and then there's a yellow kind of debris field there. And then the submerged degree, debris field that's, that's you know, causing the waterfall. A um, Couple of interesting facts. The first is that um, kind of the volume of rock that moved is kind of between 80 or 120,000 cubic meters. And uh, that all came down uh, into the river there. Some of it was probably moved by uh, Frechette, but a lot of it remains there. Some of these are, are house-sized hunks of rock, so they're not, not going anywhere anywhere time fast. Also, if you look at the, um, the right-hand side of the photo, this is the east side of the river. It's kind of out thrust of rock actually carries on uh, below the water line here and, and forms a sill that traps a lot of that submerged debris behind it. So even you know if we had a big freshet, there's a there's a bedrock sill here holding back a lot of that material. Um, I think I mentioned uh, before we started recording, but um, we did discover this you know partway through the migration season in in 2019. Um, the first the first uh, reports and then site inspection all happened in the week of the 25th of June. Uh, we realized it was probably going to be a significant bar barrier to migration. Um, and that's when we started uh, the different emergency and now normal uh, response to it. Uh, this is just another photo uh, taken from a helicopter, just showing again, 
a slightly different perspective. But again, you can see on the uh, on the east side of the river here, there's a outthrust of rock that continues under the surface, and then just a massive field of of huge boulders behind here. Um, it's really hard to tell until you get down there, but I mean, the drop rate here is is five or six meters, and some of these boils are big enough to take a uh, to take a school bus. Um, it's a uh, it's one of those things that's very hard to show uh, visually, but uh, it's just astonishing in person. So, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that uh, the Fraser River was the largest river in British Columbia. It supports uh, a, an enormous number of fisheries. Um, and the reason that this impediment is, is really serious is because of the amount of the watershed and the stocks that are blocked from passing. Um, I mean, these are approximate numbers uh, of the different management units of, of phrase or salmon that are or are not impacted by the slide. Um, um, you know, salmon tend to be managed uh, based on shared life history and vulnerability to fisheries. So, you know, we get your spring, uh, your spring Chinook, your summer Chinook, your fall Chinook. You know, based on their timing to the river and, and elements of their life history. Uh, sockeye are split into four large management groups, uh, early steward, early summer, summer and late, again based on their run timing and vulnerability to fisheries, uh, coho or interior and lower uh, Fraser. And, and you can just see what proportion of those management units all have to migrate through the slide area and, we, and what proportion we expect to be impacted in one way or another. You can see it, it's pretty dramatic. And I guess the relevance to, to fisheries is that we might not be trying to direct a fishery on, on any one of these particular stocks, especially if they have a, a large migration impediment. But uh, a lot of our fisheries are mixed stock. When you reduce the productivity or the harvestable surplus or the allowable harm on the co-migrating stocks, uh, it, you really start to impact your ability to harvest more abundant stocks. So, you know, for example, if uh, if our spring 1-3 uh, Chinook are, um, are really impacted by the slide, and we have to reduce our fisheries on that, that, that impacts our ability to harvest, you know, more abundant Strait of Georgia stocks or, or Puget Sound stocks that might be migrating at the same time in spaces as the Chinook. That's just speaking, I guess, to the relevance. So as far as as far as the monitoring work we're doing, kind of our objectives, we have three kind of overriding objectives. Um, the first is to inform in season decision making. Um, you know, we have the ability to do things like track, trap, truck and transport, fish around the waterfall, um, and collect salmon for enhancement to speed the rebuilding of populations that have been impacted and so forth. But you know, it all has to be done in context of you know, what is doing more or less harm? Uh, handling fish to transport them does impose a, you know, a, a potential mortality or at least a, a, a survival or fecundity cost. So, um, you know, the, a large part of the program is focused on understanding exactly how salmon are approaching and migrating through the waterfall so we can uh, know whether or not it's a good idea to turn on uh, something like truck and transport. Uh, the other major uh, part of our work is, is being able to, to report out on the impact of the slide on salmon stocks, um, being able to make mortality estimates and tie those into stock recruitment or other, uh, other processes are, it is pretty important. Uh, and then the final, the final focus is, again, this is a fairly unique opportunity to, to study how salmon are uh, addressing a migration barrier. Um, so really gathering as much information as possible, verifying, processing, uh, archiving, and sharing it is an important part of the part of the objectives for the, for the program. Um, again, this is a study that's kind of uh, evolved rather than being designed from the outset. It, it was, you know, initiated by the discovery of a, a landslide. <clears throat> and, uh, and yeah, we got out in the field and, and started collecting as much information as possible and trying to answer those questions. Um, you know, by the end of 2019, uh, we realized we'd probably be monitoring for a couple of years. So we took some time to kind of more clearly define our, our problems. Uh, we hosted a couple of, 
uh, uh, workshops, mostly through the SAM and treaty organization, where we we looked at what bits of information were most relevant to management and figured out how we could collect it. And so, you know, we 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 replicated many elements of the 2019 study, but we we tried to add on some extra bits to close some of the gaps identified in 2019. Uh, that was about a year ago, uh, almost to the day that we were starting to get ready to, to go in the field and start um, that collection. We did have to curtail some of our studies um, because of COVID-19. Um, we were planning on doing some juvenile tagging work that was, that was not able to proceed. We were planning on doing some other um, other tagging and and activities, kind of uh, in partnership with some First Nations groups that you know, uh, in the face of you know the, the risk of disease transmission, we decided we pause for 2020. Um, still had a very successful field season, collected loads of data, and are in the middle of processing it. Uh, and this coming season, we're planning to replicate that study. And again, uh, add some extensions to address gaps observed in 2019 and 2020. In particular, we want to do some more focus on uh, marine and lower river tagging so we can understand the cumulative impact of migration stress, not just the acute impact of the waterfall itself. Um, so uh, as far as observations, what did we collect uh, in 2019 and 2020? We, uh, we had quite a large uh, radio tagging program. We put in um, Kind of over 1,500 radio tags on Chinook, uh, Sockeye, uh, Coho, and Pink uh, in 2019 and 2020. We also had uh, sonar stations uh, above and below the slide that allowed us to, to count the number of salmon approaching and leaving the slide area. We paired that with uh, samples. Uh, we, we took fat probes. Uh, we collected uh, blood and tissues for, uh, for hormone analysis. Uh, we got tissue samples, especially gill samples, to look for evidence of gas bubble trauma or uh, damage due to uh, sedimentation. Collected DNA samples from all the fish we handled. As well, there's a, an extensive network of test fisheries and terminal escapement programs that we can use to kind of put the information we gathered into context. So um, I mentioned radio tags a couple of times. Uh, we we're in I don't know if we're in a, a, a totally unique position, but we were able to put together an extensive uh, radio telemetry network uh, throughout the Fraser watershed, uh, although we didn't really extend it into the Thompson that far. You can see the map here just kind of shows all the different uh, receiver stations, uh, as well as uh, the tagging sites. The yellow triangles represent the tagging sites. Uh, the bulk of our tagging happened at Lillooet here. Uh, we did do some tagging at the slide site, as well as uh, in the lower river, and some marine tagging out on the Persane test fisheries that operate past Port Hardy. Um, the, the tags that were put on then migrated through the whole river. Um, we had a large network of receivers right in and around the rock slide area. Um, that was to, to get a better understanding of uh, how fish are behaving kind of right up in the face of the waterfall. And then we had a, a network through the north uh, to, to let us understand how fish that passed through uh, this slide uh, did or did not survive to spawn. So uh, radio tags are, are pretty cool. Um, they let you really get a great understanding of, of how an individual fish is behaving. Um, this is just an example figure uh, Kendra Robinson made. This is a Chinook that was tagged in 2019. Um, on the y-axis here are all the different sites. They're arranged from downriver at the bottom uh, to upriver, although some of them are truncated off the top here just so it's a more pleasing figure. Then on the date that the fish was detected at a different array is along the bottom here. And then you can see tracking uh, what this fish did. The red line here kind of represents the landslide. Um, the, the light blue lines represent our two sonar stations upstream of the slide and downstream. Um, just for context, this churn upstream sonar site, there are no tributaries between the slide and churn. Uh, this is about 40 kilometers upriver. Uh, it's alfalfa, 
is probably about you know four or five kilometers down river. Um, and you can see, yeah, the tag went on right here at the slide, or sorry, right here downstream the slide, the fish migrated up, was unable to pass, migrated down, migrated up, and carried on migrating up and down for about a month uh, before uh, we lost track of it. Uh, I, I imagine at that point it died and sunk to the bottom of the river. Um, but, you know, with, with the number of tags we, we put on, we, we have all these different observations of individual behavior that we can use to build up a picture of what the populations are experiencing. Another important thing that we can get is we can look at migration speeds. Uh, these are just a couple of uh, density plots of um, migration speed observations. Um, there's three figures there. The leftmost figure is, is just any time we had receivers more than 10K apart and we had a sockeye pass between them, we got a ping and a speed measurement. Uh, you can see that we had the pink is the upstream, uh, the blue is the downstream measurements. We had uh, you know, 917 observations of fish swimming upstream, 179 observations of fish swimming downstream between receivers on the main stem. This nice bimodal pattern of, of migration speeds. We kind of subset the data a little bit in the next two figures. In the middle is the um, is the receiver set between Lillooet and the slide area. So we were tagging fish at Lillooet as well as at the slide area. So fish that were tagged at Lillooet, then once they resumed their migration, uh, traveled between Lillooet and the slide. And you can see they had a you know kind of a, a different and slightly slower migration speed. And the right hand most figure again is fish that had passed the slide and were migrating between our upper sonar site and uh, we had a, a, a receiver site at the confluence of the Fraser and the Chilcotin. And again, you can see the, the kind of upstream migration speeds. What's, what's really interesting uh, for me about this is uh, I did some thesis work looking at how you model uh, a migration through fisheries. And one of the key points is, is uh, when you have assumptions about fixed migration speed, you end up with um, you know, the potential to introduce artifacts into your exposure to fisheries models. Or... And so I really like this because it shows that there is variability in migration speed. Also, um, anecdotally, we kind of assume a a 30 to 40 kilometer a day migration speed for sockeye um, in, in the models that we're currently using on the Fraser. Uh, so I think that you know there's room to uh, room to improve that here. Um, the migration speed information also allows us to understand when different stocks of salmon should be at the slide. The sonar lets us know the uh, the absolute count. But um, you know understanding migration speed and stock composition allows us to kind of infer what the population level impacts are. Um, I mentioned the sonar uh, a couple of times now, just a map showing where the two sonar sites are. We had one below and one above uh, the landslide area. Um, again, there's no tributaries between uh, either site and the landslide. So we're pretty sure that if, if we count you uh, approaching the slide site, you're not going anywhere else. And if we count you leaving the slide site, you haven't come from anywhere else. And we haven't missed anyone along the way. Um, what kind of information does that give us? That gives us um, some pretty cool paired counts. Uh, when you use the migration speed information, you can offset your upstream counts uh, by the migration time and, and line them up with the downstream count. So we can see the blue line on this figure represents our counts at the downstream side of the slide. The orange line represents the uh, upstream counts. Again, this is the 2019 uh, data. <clears throat> you can see there was a lot more fish that approached the slide than passed through in 2019. Some of that is likely due to that uh, milling or cycling behavior I showed in the radio tag figure. So we can correct for that. Uh, another interesting fact was that our, our downstream sonar uh, location was also a pink salmon spawning location. So we have Again, we have the tags to allow us to, to, to separate out double counts and things like that, but um, I, I really think it shows the strength of, of combining the approaches. If we didn't have the radio tags, we would not 
ha have known that we were having these double counter issues. Uh, in 2020, we had the same setup. It was a significantly different migration year, and there was a lot of in-river rock blasting done over the winter. So we saw a very different pattern. Uh, the first was it was a very high uh, prolonged freshet in 2020, and we really didn't see any salmon starting to approach the slide site uh, until the discharge in the river dropped below about 5,200 cubic meters per second. That's a big contrast to 2019 when there were fish uh, up there uh, pretty much the whole period we were monitoring. Um, and also you see the period of delay uh, kind of as evidence between the difference between the two, uh, the two sites uh, it was much, much lower. Uh, it's just kind of pretty cool. Um, other observations we took, again, we had a lot of visual and catch observations. Uh, we measured water discharge and we've, we've begun to, to measure uh, surface velocities again. So hopefully we can pair our more uh, fine scale movement from the radio tags with a fine scale uh, velocity map through the slide area. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're doing some physiological data collection and another big piece is we did collect information on strength. We, we took DNA samples from areas where we saw unexpectedly high aggregations of sockeye, um, things like uh, the Seton or the Bridge River where we don't expect a large return, but in 2019 or 2020, there were a lot of fish. We took enough DNA samples to be able to estimate how many were straying. Uh, we've also taken uh, juvenile DNA samples to look at the, um, the potential for uh, reproductive success of those straying fish. Um, so this is a real busy figure, but it's, it kind of pulls together all the information that we collected and, and I think lays it out in an interesting format. I'll talk you through it. Um, so first, uh, the, the y-axis here is the, the discharge at Big Bar, and it corresponds to this gray line, bumps up and down as, as the water levels did throughout the season. Uh, date is along the uh, x-axis. The uh, the kind of dark blue on my screen line here along the bottom is not scaled to anything. It just shows the uh, the sonar counts at churn. Uh, again, it's there for reference and to put the radio tag information in context. So each of the dots represents a successful migration of a radio tagged, I'm oh, sorry, a day with a successful migration of radio tagged salmon. And they're color coded. So there's Chinook that were successfully passing through here, you know, one, one or two sockeye passed through there, then there was a gap and more passed through here. Same with uh, pinks and, and coho. Uh, the gray bars are just kind of to help people uh, see that, you know, when we saw salmon passing via radio tags, we, we also saw increases in counts at the sonar stations. And along the very bottom here is just kind of the average expected timing of the different uh, salmon stocks or, or species through the slide area. And, and again, this, not this story here, but what we can draw from this is that there's a very strong influence of discharge on passage. It's not a, an unusual or, or unexpected finding, but it's nice to get the confirmation both from the radio tags and from the sonar um, that, that, yeah, uh, we have some real distinct uh, migration thresholds associated with discharge through the slide area. This is the data from 2019. It's a similar figure from 2020. Uh, the only real difference here is um, uh, in this figure, kind of along the 500 cubic meters per second here, there are squares that indicate uh, tagging activity. So each square represents a day when we put tags on the different species of salmon. And then the circles, triangles, or squares higher up indicate when we observe them passing. So I think in particular, uh, you can see we were able to get tags on spring Chinook as early as the beginning of June. But we didn't see any fish passing uh, through the slide area until the beginning of August. And it's mirrored by the sonar counts along the x-axis here. You know, really no, no movement, uh, no passage uh, until right at the beginning of August there when the water level dropped. Um, and, and why we care about discharge 
and passage, it's because of the interaction of run timing and, and the hydrograph. This figure is kind of meant to summarize the interannual effect of those overlaps. Um, I hope it's I hope it's clear, but you know the the gray line through the middle of the screen here represents the mean discharge uh, through that area. You get your standard deviations or the dotted lines around it, and then the red, green, and yellow bar represent the observed discharge threshold. So anytime a discharge is higher than the red, green, or yellow line, you don't expect uh, salmon of that species to be able to pass. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there was some work done in 2020, rock blasting and so forth. So you can see those discharge thresholds did move from the lower levels up to higher levels, which means that, you know, on average, more of the time, uh, more Chinook would be able to pass, more Sake would be able to pass, and more Coho would be able to pass. But, I mean, it still speaks to the need for continued remediation. Um, this is another way of, of, of looking at that data. So, Rather than looking at the mean discharge and standard deviations, this is um, this is a figure where uh, we've gone through and we've looked at the discharge pattern in 1952, compared it to the threshold, and then we've uh, you know made an indication of the number or the proportion of days of that migration period for that stock that they would be um, um, blocked from passing, and you can see that and this is based on the 2019 thresholds. You can see that for your early time stocks, it's it, it, it's it, it's a massive amount of delay. Your later time stock, it's less, but you know still a, a lot of years with with forty or fifty percent uh, of your migration period being blocked. Um, now we saw an improvement of those discharge thresholds in 2020, and what it does is is really it cuts all these figures in half uh, rather than early Stewart, you know being blocked most of the time, they're blocked about half of the time now. And it's the same pattern for the others, the other populations. Um, and now we're currently using uh, discharge to predict um, passage success, failure, or delay. Um, I talked about how migration speed and timing varies between the years and how and discharge does as well. But what's really important is, is the impact on um, you know populations in terms of survival or mortality of discharge is unclear. Um, obviously, being delayed in your migration has has costs. Uh, you know these salmon are operating on a, a pretty finite time scale. They have to be at their spawning locations at specific times. They're held up for too long. They're they're kind of out of luck. Um, we, right now, we have a we're, we're processing our radio telemetry data from 2020. Uh, this is our, our first cut at it, and you can see each of the blue bars uh, represents a count of, of radio tags arriving at the slide. You can see here, uh, you know, before the 27th of June, we have one, one tag arriving at the slide. And then higher up, the, um, the black dot or the lines represent how long that fish was delayed. So this, this fellow who was tagged here before the 27th of June then spent 48 days uh, delayed below the slide. So that's got to be having an impact on, on, on his fitness, right? And you can see that uh, as, as the season progresses and as the, as the hydrograph drops, that delay time does, does drop down. But we are experiencing, or we're observing salmon experiencing a delay uh, even at discharges below those thresholds. So there's got to be a, an energetic uh, cost to, to this migration, an increased energetic cost to this migration. And we're right now we're trying to pair these delay observations up with our survival to spawn observations. Um, one of the other things we can do, um, we can combine all the different types of data, come up with survival estimates. Uh, I have an example here for early Stewart. Um, I'm using them as an example because uh, they have really the, the nicest data and it's the easiest to talk through. We'll use a similar method for the other populations. Uh, our early Stewart, the most uh, are the earliest migrating sockeye stocks. So we had their data in hand first. Um, but, you know, in 2019, we managed to put 25 tags on early stewards uh, below the slide. Of those 25 tags, none of them successfully migrated through. Uh, in 2019, we were moving 
uh, fish around the slide as well. We tagged 24 early Stewart fish that were moved around the slide. Of those 24, 16 made it to the confluence of the Chilcotin, and two made it up to Fort St. James. That's our tagging data suggesting astonishing low, astonishingly low survival rates. And we pair that with a couple of other pieces of data not collected by uh, my program, uh, collected by you know, the Sockeye Stock Assessment Group or uh, the Pacific Salmon Commission. And you see a similar, a similar picture, right? They only counted 89 early steward spawners on the grounds up there. But the Salmon Commission estimates about 26,000 of them uh, pass the mission. So, you know, uh, either, either source of data is kind of telling you the same story. It was a real bad year to be an early steward sockeye. Um, I have a, a summary slide that kind of, you know, pulls out some major population groups and makes similar estimates for them. Again, you can see, depending on what time you arrived at the slide, you had a, you know, a from terrible to you know not great experience. You were a very early migrating stock like the early stewards, you had less than a percent survival. Middle time stocks like the Nadina, we're looking at more like you know 43% survival. And later time stocks uh, you know, had up to about 8% survival. We did a similar uh, piece of work with the Chinook, uh, split out by uh, you know the kind of the management units there. Um, and so if you were an earlier spring Chinook, you were looking at more like 10% uh, survival, where if you were a later summer Chinook, more like a 50% survival. Coho, we didn't have uh, quite as nice data, but uh, you know, we, were, we were thinking that it's probably about 20% survival of Coho um, based on tags and the spawner to spawner uh, ratios between up and down river populations. Um, I notice I'm running a little bit late here, so I won't walk through the calculation again, but we did a, the same calculation again in 2020 uh, with, with, with better results. Your early time migrants, again, terrible survival, but the medium and later timed arrivals all had a relatively high survival. So the link between delay and mortality really needs to be tightened up there so that we can be a little bit more uh, predictive in uh, not just migration, through the slide success, but migration success in general. Uh, similar story for Chinook, they appear to have had a much better year, although uh, we're still running our, um, our population estimates for Chinook and the coho uh, escapement work is still ongoing, so I don't have those calculations yet. Uh, for 2021, we plan to build on the current program uh, especially, we're hoping to really expand our coverage in the slide area and do some mobile tracking. We've got, uh, you know, surface velocity maps through this slide area, and we'd really love to see how salmon are interacting with uh, the velocity patterns. Um, you know, the, the science activities that I'm, I'm working on are going to be based on, on those kind of three principles of providing in-season information right away providing population level information and gathering as much data as possible. We do have some uh, flexibility to, to work with partners to, to, to generate more information. Um, as always, um, I'm hoping that we'll all get vaccinated by July, but um, until then we will have to modify some of our activities to account for uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, I like this figure a lot because one of the things everybody asks me isn't about our cool, um, our cool, you know, mortality modeling or, or telemetry. They want to know what the fishway is going to look like. So this slide lets me uh, tell people what the fishway is going to look like, but also tell them how we're planning to uh, to monitor things next season. Um, you can see there, there's kind of a. a, a a cartoon of, of what the fishway is going to look like. Um, they're building the foundation right now. I imagine with the way it looks like things are starting to soften up uh, and the water's coming back up, um, they probably will not get much more done this winter. They'll have to finish it next winter, but that's what it's supposed to look like. It's a double slot fishway uh, right through kind of the the crest of the waterfall there. Um, and we're planning on monitoring it using a bunch of different uh, antennas and cameras. Uh, this is a view 
looking west from um, kind of the cliff above. Um, I think I actually took this photo. Um, but we have a cluster of cameras here that allow us to map the surface velocity. Uh, these other cameras up here, again, allow us to map the surface velocity through areas of interest uh, to migration. Same with these ones here. Then we have a whole set of radio receivers. One of the big improvements in our study this year is that we've also uh, secured some accelerometer tags. So we'll be able to get, um, with the accelerometer receivers, we'll be able to get uh, downloads of the uh, G-forces that the fish have experienced uh, in, in different areas. Uh, and we're also putting some water temperature and depth sensors through there in the hopes of being able to build a nice big uh, three-dimensional fluid dynamics model uh, of, of what the river is doing that we can overlay our radio telemetry information on and understand how fish are migrating through there. Um, I'm pretty excited about that, to be honest. Um, so what are we working on next? Well, the first is, I, I think the telemetry work in particular exposed some major gaps in our modeling of, of salmon migration through the Fraser River. We'll be working to close those. Um, we have some models that kind of link en route mortality to different environmental effects like discharge uh, and temperature. Uh, the information we're collecting should allow us to improve those. That's particularly relevant for uh, Fraser Sockeye where those en route mortality models are used uh, as part of the in-season management to set TAC. Uh, Anne-Marie uh, Wong is in the middle of uh, working on a recovery potential assessment for Fraser Sockeye. Uh, she used the data we collected to inform a couple of, uh, you know, kind of future productivity scenarios for fish above Big Bar. <clears throat> They're putting a fish ladder in at some point. Someone's going to have to make sure that thing's working. I think that'll probably uh, fall to us. I also think the, the data we're collecting, <coughs> pardon me, and the work we're doing would be a really fantastic platform to enable other studies. Um, we're putting on a whole pile of radio tags. We're describing migration uh, in a lot of ways. I think it would be a great control for someone who wanted to do an experimental manipulation or something else. Uh, we're very open to collaboration. We're, we're working with the Pacific Salmon Foundation and a bunch of different First Nations partners. Uh, they're using our infrastructure and expanding uh, the studies are doing. The province is interested in tagging some sturgeon. We'll be monitoring for their frequencies as well. And um, uh, we've got uh, job opportunities as well. Uh, we've got uh, field crew opportunities for graduate students who, who want to get some uh, hands-on experience with the fish. We also have money uh, for postdoctoral studies and um, you know biologist opportunities or contract work. Anyways, I realize that um, I have about 15 minutes left. I did want to leave time for questions. Um, so I think I'll pause now. My email address is right there at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions or I uh, want to follow up, follow up about jobs or collaboration opportunities, uh, the easiest way to get a hold of me is, is to send an email. Uh, thanks. I think I'll pause there. Uh, Murdoch or Carl, if you want to take over. Yeah, thanks very much. Mike for really interesting talk. Um, I've got some questions, but I'll hold off. Uh, see if uh, anybody else has questions. Carl, just one quick one, Mike. The uh, <laughs> the spring type Chinook, which is kind of the scariest one in terms of being endangered, other than uh, than the uh, early Stuart sockeye. Those things don't spawn right away, anyway, right? They go up and they basically hold over the summer until they spawn. So I find it a little difficult to see why a delay down at that site would be that much different from the delay that they're going to do once they get up into those headwater rivers. And maybe maybe they're a lot colder water they'll be in over the summer. I'm not sure. Well, what's the thinking uh, about that? Yeah, no, that's a really uh, that's a really cool question, Carl. This might be a little bit just so story, right? We haven't we haven't dug through it all the way, but. One of the major differences between 2019 and 2020 that we observed was, <clears throat> uh, I did mention that we didn't see a lot of salmon uh, migration at all at discharges above about 5,200 cubic meters per second. That meant 
like no migration uh, anywhere between Lillooet and the slide area. Um, whereas in 2019, uh, fish were actively trying to migrate through the slide all the way through that period. So I think there's differences in the types of delay. If, if you're delayed, if you're hunkered down at the mouth of a river or a, a creek, uh, I think that delay is significantly different than you're, you're beating yourself up over and over again, trying to get through, a, 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 through the landslide. And, and you're right, the link between uh, duration of delay and, and eventual spawning success is, is one of the big questions we have. With sockeye, it's a little bit easier to, you know, they're on much more of a, a, a timer than, than something like a spring chinook with those large fat reserves. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Mike, did you did you plot uh, against temperature as well as velocity? We got lucky. Uh, both years were uh, pretty cool years, uh, but that is something that that we do have to watch out for. Um, and 2019, we only had a couple of days above 19, 19 degrees Celsius water, and in 2020, uh, uh, we didn't have any. So you don't believe that temperature was a factor? In those years, no. Uh, in future years, it, it could could well be. So Mike, I got a question about the um, hydrograph. And uh, so as Carl pointed out, and it's clear on your slides, the uh, early Stewart uh, are really disadvantaged by showing up uh, early and they did really badly in both years in terms of uh, percentage surviving to the spawning grounds. And uh, it, it seems because they arrive early um, and if there's a lot of velocity and volume, uh, their chances are not really good. So even with that fist passage put in, uh, and, and the current hydrograph, like uh, what are their chances of, uh, you know, how are there projections of, of how much that uh, survival would, would improve uh, with a fish passage or is it, you just totally have no idea? I mean, there are projections, Murdoch, but um, I mean, early Stewart have a very challenging migration, you know, outside of the landslide area, right? Um, you know, for example, in, in 2020, um, you know, we, we really did see, uh, you know, it's, this is really digging into it. So sorry for folks who aren't uh, as interested, but um, for sockeye, there's a hydroacoustic station at Mission operated by the Pacific Salmon Commission. There's one at uh, Quail Arc or Yale operated by DFO. We saw a, a large number of, of salmon approaching <clears throat> the mission site passing through, approaching the quail arc site and passing through. <clears throat> we did not see nearly that many approaching and passing through our downstream sonar site. So there was probably some significant en route loss associated with uh, Hell's Gate. Yeah, we can fix this particular uh, constriction or, or barrier in the river, but um, I, I don't I don't think it's the only problem that early Stewart are going to have. I think I think it's worth uh, letting everybody know generally that this early Stewart sockeye stock uh, is the furthest migrating sockeye stock in the Fraser. It goes uh, it's almost 800 kilometers up to the head of Tacla Lake, where Driftwood River spawning would be. So these fish have to come in early. They have to spawn early because the streams they're spawning in are the get hold fast ice on the bottom so the they have to the fry have to hatch really early their life cycle is very strongly selected to this really early run even if it subjects them to horrific problems uh during the migration and they've been going down basically since the 1970s they started down way back then and they've been having problems uh, so this is just kind of the last, maybe the last gas for those poor things. So I just had a question about systematic change in, in the hydrograph. Like uh, uh, there's, I guess, a lot of observation that, okay, systematically the landscape's been changing. There's deforestation and um, a lot of other things that going on that and change in, in weather regimes and so on uh, that could be changing the hydrograph systematically over uh, decades. Uh, has has there been some analysis to see how that early hydrograph is, has systematically changed or not? Um, especially that uh, the ones the one that the uh, early Stewart encounter, and the, given the run timing. 
Uh, there, there absolutely has, Murdoch, uh, not by me, and I don't think I can speak to it with, with a lot of authority, but um, I believe at UVic, there's a Pacific Climate Consortium that takes the uh, kind of the, the UN climate models and then uh, downscales them for the, for the province. Um, I know that they've looked at changes in, in both current and, and projected changes in the hydrograph. Um, and I, I think that uh, Sue Grant, who works at the department, has been trying to link that to um, the kind of you know, future outcomes for salmon stocks like the early steward or others that have a, you know, a, a strong migration driver that's now running into a, a, an environmental change that's not really working out for them. Murdoch, this is Eric. Hey, Eric. Yeah. Now, this, this is going to be a controversial question, but uh, I just thought uh, I'd ask it to stir the pot. There's a um, study on downstream migration of smolts in the Fraser versus the Columbia. And controversially, they, they actually have better survival in the Columbia. I have no idea why I haven't looked at it. It strikes me in a sense that the adult migration in the Columbia may actually have higher survival than the Fraser. Is the, I mean, have you guys thought about that or looked at that or anything like that? Um, sorry, Eric, I think your question has two parts. The first was about juvenile migration. Um, no, no, uh, I, I really don't mind about the juvenile because I'm familiar with that stuff. Okay. Okay. It's, and you're talking about the adult migration upstream. And uh, I, again, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a proponent of dams on the Fraser, but uh, you know, if you had a dam on the Fraser, um, maybe it would be easier for the adults to get up there. Uh, can you, have you guys compared the Fraser migration mortality? This is really high compared that to the migration mortality in the Columbia. Uh, I have not. I'll tell you though, Dave Patterson uh, is in the middle of putting together a paper to review uh, on route mortality of Fraser sockeye. So uh, mm -hmm. I could, uh, I, I could sh sh shift that question off to him. Well, the comparison would be to the Redfish Lake sockeye. So the Sawtooth Mountains where they're trying to restore and they've had some success in getting them all the way up into the snake. The lakes are up at 5,000 feet. Uh, it, it, it's just would be interesting to look at the adult survival in the Columbia versus the Fraser. Okay, well, I guess I, one thing I do want to point out is mm -hmm. the terrible survival is most often associated with earlier time migrating stocks mm -hmm. and, you know, temperature or discharge, let's call them abnormalities. So I think in my mind, the scale of damming you'd need to turn the Fraser from a kind of a free flowing into a controllable watershed where you could manage temperatures and flows through the use of dams is, it's pretty extreme. Because, <laughs> you know, essentially, you know, you'd be using dams to substitute for your, you know, um, I'm not structural, but uh, you know, long-term persistent changes in <clears throat> in um, you know snowpack and and the ability of different watersheds to to hold and slowly release water, right? Yeah, we don't need to spend time on this. I'm just uh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, it's cool, but yeah, it's that's the engineering background coming out. I'm just excited by the idea <laughs> of being able to mess with a system. Sorry, folks. Hey, just one other question. Uh, my kind of a dumb question, but it's just like, given the instability of rock um, at the Big Bar Slide uh, that gave rise to that massive, you know, bunch of rock getting dumped into the river, surely there must have been some uh, geological assessment to see what's, uh, you know, the current stability. Uh, are you just waiting for another slide to happen? Like, you're going to put in all this uh, fish ladder 
and it's right in the place where the slide happened before. Like, uh, uh, has there been some like careful assessment of stability there to, to make sure that there's no further serious risk? Uh, there has. Um, I'm not that kind of uh, engineer, uh, but yeah, no, they've um, both DFO and the contractor doing the work have retained different geotechnical engineering companies to do assessments and and they're doing uh, stabilization work. Also that paper I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that uh, Vendetti in Nature uh, 2014, he talks about the uh, erosion processes. It's a really neat paper. I, I recommend you check it out. Um, I, I hate to paraphrase it and get it all wrong right now. But, um, also, I believe there's some processes underway uh, where folks are you know, building on that work that Jeremy's a geological group has done and mapping uh, kind of the, the points of risk along the Fraser, which, you know, I, I think is really super cool. So are there other known high risk spots that you really got to uh, investigate or is this a big bar? Is that, is that the, the uh, sort of the, the only one that really had a lot of risk or like seeing, seeing what you've read and understood? Well, I mean, I guess it's, it's tricky, right? Cause on a geological scale, there's lots and lots of very risky bedrock canyons between basically Hope and, and all of the tributaries, right? But, you know, like the likelihood of something happening in any particular year is quite low, but there's, there's a large number of them. So I, I don't know. The risk analysis there is, I, I think, I mean, you do your study, maybe you invest in some contingency plans, but you don't go around, you know, rock bolting the whole of the river. Is there some understanding of what actually triggered this particular massive slide? Or it was uh, just w waiting to happen? Yeah, and, and again, uh, the, the, the Vendetti paper does describe it, but when the flow is constrained by a bedrock canyon like that, it, um, it, it causes upwelling that scours out the bottom of the, of the cliffs. And then at some point they just, they just let go and, and you get these large slumps um, I think, again, I'm not sure if it's that paper or a paper someone in this lab has done, but they do go through and identify a couple of places in the Fraser where clearly it happened over the last, you know, 10,000 years. Surely there must be one or two other questions. If Rob Bison is still there, ask something about steelhead. Hi, Mike. I, I'm not sure what to ask. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rob, how's it going? Good. Uh, um, I think last year we had an arrangement because you were expecting maybe no steelhead to be encountered or just a few that you would just tag them just like you would say like coho or something. I, I'm hoping that's still in place. Uh, well, I mean, I don't mind spending the tags. We, I think we just have to get agreement from everyone that, that, that we want to handle and tag them. Um, there were some people who got a little surprised that we were handling endangered steelhead last year. Okay. Well, we can work through that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, I mean, if, if we catch one, I don't mind tagging it. Uh, although I think over the last, like in 2020, we maybe captured, I, I want to say six steelhead. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure some of them might have been bridge, bridge bound. So I, I don't know. We, we should probably chat about the value of that information. Again, I don't mind doing the work for you since we're out there. And mm -hmm. since uh, your, your folks had a uh, Prince George are helping us out on the receiver front. So I, I don't mind at all. Yeah, J just 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 for the curiosity of the group, maybe the we we forecast how many we can roughly forecast how many spawners we get to the Chilcotin by test fishing in the lower Fraser in the two years that the slide has been in place. Uh, the what we've seen on the spawning grounds relative to what we would have forecasted based on basically pre slide data down from the test fishery. There wasn't anything obvious about missing fish on the spawning grounds. So the, the, the rough information we have so far is that Chilcote and Steelhead seem to be able to negotiate the site uh, without much trouble, at least anyways. Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? Rob, uh, they, they're not trying to migrate through there, you know, uh, during the high discharge periods. They certainly have the, the reserves to be able to hunker down if, if the migration doesn't seem to be going well and try again later. Yeah. Well, I think uh, timing wise, they'd be, I think they'd be the last in the sequence of all the species. And then uh, what, what clips, what drives their 
migration timing, because of course they spawn in the spring, they have like six months to go before they spawn. Uh, they only need to be above the major migration hurdles, like uh, before Big Bar, the, 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 the major migration hurdle would have been um, Bridge River. So they needed to get above Bridge River before, basically before temperatures got too cold. So it's the temperature. It's the temperature factor that that shuts the door, so to speak, on 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 their timing, and then, and that's why that's why all steelhead in the interior fraser are summer steelhead as opposed to winter steelhead, of course. So, yeah, that's pretty interesting. I didn't share the slide here. Um, again, I, I was worried about going long, but um, we've noticed in both 2019 and 2020 a dramatic stop in coho migration associated with uh, river temperature. Uh, they were they're getting through this slide um, and then as soon as the water temperature dropped below about six degrees celsius um, they they stopped being able to pass mm -hmm. um, kind of think it's it's you know you know there are definitely hypotheses that need to be tested and that's part of the reason we want to really uh, increase the amount of fine scale monitoring we're doing particularly at the end of the season next year um, but you know, it, it probably as a result of, you know, the duration of sustained effort required to get through there, even if the water level has dropped enough that they're not unable to pass, but once the, it gets cold enough that um, they're no longer able to sustain this, the effort through that long period, um, yeah, they, they seem to stop. So I, I think it's, it's really a neat area and Again, um, yeah, the combination of the surface velocity mapping, uh, the temperature and discharge, and the fine scale uh, monitoring of individual fish movement through there, I think will. Like, I just one last question um, on the fate of the uh, like uh, salmon that arrived in 2019 um, that uh, you know didn't pass. Like uh, you said, that all the salmon uh, just swam away and died, <clears throat> but then um, you also indicated that. There was some spawning, perhaps increased spawning, uh, you know, downstream in, in some of the uh, tributary rivers. So for each of the species, for example, like sockeye pink chinook, um, you know, of those fish that wanted to pass, couldn't pass, you know, what did they do? Did they just all die or, or could you have some understanding of where they redistributed and, and to spawn? Yeah, um, well, for pink, we, we can't. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the ability to, to uh, like genetically distinguish where a pink is intending to go. For Chinook and uh, uh, sockeye, we have better baselines and are more able to, to describe that. We certainly saw a straying of sockeye and Chinook into the bridge and Seton systems. These are, you can see the, the red dot is kind of the, the, the big bar slide there. It's these, these major tributaries here. Um, uh, as far as the, the number, we didn't, get as many DNA samples from the spawners as I would have liked. We know there were uh, strays spawning in there, uh, but you know, given the small sample size, I'm not super confident that it was, you know, like, you know, 4,000 Chilco sockeye spawned in there or anything like that. Um, it's more work needed. I'm really hoping that uh, if we get enough juvenile samples, we'll be able to understand what the reproductive success of any, any strays was. Yeah, with sockeye, given that they're adapted to the systems uh, to which they go to spawn, what's your sort of like a guess about like if it was a choco fish or a quenelle fish, if they spawned in, in uh, Seton Creek or some other system where they don't normally like where, where they're not intending to go, um, are those all those uh, juveniles like uh, would would they even if they they emerged and you know as fry would, would there, are they dead fish? I mean that's the that's the assumption, uh, but I mean I'd, I'd really like to test that before I started you know, saying definitive things. There, you have to remember, you know, the, the major blockage at Hell's Gate means that a lot of these populations are, uh, were, you know, supported through reintroduction or uh, enhancement in the past. So there could be a fair amount of plasticity there. So yeah, I, I think it's a cool area of study. And again, I mentioned at the beginning of talk, Ben Sutherland from the Molecular Genetics Lab. It's an area of research interest for him. So I think he'll be digging into that uh, quite a bit. 
and looking at genetic predictors of, of timing and how that changes, you know, pre and post slide. Just add a teeny bit to that. There's been a lot of recolonization of parts of the Fraser since the Hell's Gate disaster. So these fish are spreading around naturally. They are dispersing naturally and they are being selected to uh, have higher fitness in the places where they're able to spawn at all. So this is, as Mike says, this is an ongoing process, and that was a very good answer to that question. So there was at least some educational value, learning value from the Hell's Gate. You learned, we managed to learn that there is some hope after a big slide. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Okay, great. Uh, just it's it's related, isn't it? Isn't it more given what we understand historically about pig salmon in particular? Isn't it more accurate to characterize um, the occurrence of pig salmon above well ab above bridge, as far as I understand? But uh, of course that would include above big bar as or as as range expansion by way of fish fishways as opposed to natural recolonization. Um, okay, again, this is a little outside of my wheelhouse, Rob, so if I'm wrong, please forgive me, but my understanding is that before Hell's Gate, there was actually a pretty substantial upriver pink salmon populations. In the more recent time period, it's about, about 30% or so uh, of the pink population tends to migrate past, past hope, so... Yeah, Mike, there was uh, none were seen by DFO people between or salmon, Pacific Salmon Commission people between Hell's Gate, uh, the, the time of Hell's Gate in 1948, when pink salmon were found up in uh, Merritt area someplace, the river that goes through Merritt. And then they, they, they reappeared rapidly uh, after that in other areas along the main stem. And, Tributaries. Thanks again, Mike. That that was really interesting, really fascinating. It's nice to see uh, a lot of effort study on this uh, big uh, big slide and and uh, see what you've learned and what you're what you're doing to uh, because to restore things. So thanks, thanks again.